The letter is presented by Hunt a Killer. If you love intricate puzzles and unpredictable mysteries, Hunt a Killer could be exactly what you've been waiting for. They make immersive murder mystery games where you get to be the detective. You can pick from standalone one-shot criminal cases, longer multi-chapter mystery boxes, jigsaw puzzles, books, or an exclusive monthly subscription storyline that unfolds over six months. They also make great gifts for the game, mystery, or true crime lover in your life. Solve a mystery, hunt a killer. Go to huntakiller.com slash the letter and use the code the letter for $10 off your purchase. That's huntakiller.com slash the letter and code the letter. If you need the news, but also need to feel smarter and calmer, then you need to get in Andy Slavitt's bubble. Andy is a former White House advisor and the ultimate outsider's insider. Every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, Andy offers his access to leading experts. Join Andy for discussions on COVID, gun violence, climate change, and more. In the Bubble with Andy Slavitt is available wherever you get your podcasts. Lemonada. A warning to listeners. This podcast includes descriptions of gun violence and associated trauma. Please take care when listening. The police called, and I had actually been up for so long, I had, I guess, they tell me, I was standing there and all of a sudden I just passed out on the floor. They had put me in bed and my husband came in and said, they got him, they got him. And I I was like coming to and I'm like, what? And then it hit me, I'm like, they got him. From KSL Podcasts, I'm Amy Donaldson, and this is The Letter. Episode 4, A Death Sentence Waiting to Happen. After her son's funeral, Seisnar remembers Prosecutor Bob Stott coming to her home to discuss the case with her. I said, kill him. I actually said that because I thought he deserves to die. I wanted him to die. Detective Keith Stevens presented everything police found to prosecutors. The way it looked to Keith, Sai would get her wish. We have to find all of the elements of the crime and all of the elements of this crime pointed to a capital case. They had a confession, sympathetic victims, and a strong eyewitness. It was not Keith's decision to make, but he could have some influence. I became quite a salesman into pushing what I felt was the right thing to do. And of course, we have input from from other people also, but we will advocate. I will sell the case. So did you see this then as a capital case? Absolutely. Attorney Roger Blaylock was on the prosecuting team that would make the case against the defendant. It it was just a, a very bad fact situation. And by bad, I don't mean, you know, for a prosecutor, it's a good situation because it's so terrible. You know, you're two young people up at the reservoir just kind of taking pictures of the moon and somebody comes up and shoots them both, you know? Bam, bam. What uh, is what is there about the defendant that is socially redeeming? In 1996, Mark Moffat was a young attorney working for the Salt Lake Legal Defender's Office. He and his colleagues were assigned to the case by a judge, as George didn't have the money to hire his own attorney. And right from the start, Mark said they felt the odds were stacked against them. I just remember... When that homicide occurred, when the shooting occurred, it shook the community. You know, we had two young kids at that 
were up there doing an innocent thing in a place in the mountains where everybody in the community went from time to time. Everybody goes up in the mountains to hike or get away. And um, there was just something about that case that freaked the community out. Add to that, the evidence against their client was overwhelming. George had made statements to the police, inculpatory statements. The truck that was found at the scene, I think, was registered to him or was tied to him in some way. I mean, there wasn't much question about guilt or innocence. Mark felt like it might be difficult for a jury made up of typical Utahns to relate to the struggles of an immigrant from Uruguay. Salt Lake City is about 70% white, and the surrounding county, even more so. We were worried about community-based bias against this kid. I mean, he was a brown-skinned kid with a strange last name, Benvenuto. And remember, this is a crime that happened in the 90s, a decade distinguished by tough-on-crime sentiment that spared almost no one. From minimum sentences for sex offenders to added penalties for gun crimes to sending minors straight into the adult courts. The focus was on punishment and protection. You know, you have to think back what, what our community, as of that point in time, had already imposed. I mean, Salt Lake jurors had imposed death sentences against other people. In Utah in the 90s, seven men received death sentences. And in that same time frame, the state executed three people. That might not seem like a lot compared to states like Florida or Texas. But it's the most in Utah in a single decade since the 1950s. There were a lot of reasons for Mark to think his client might get the death penalty. But the fact that George was only 19 years old when he pulled the trigger, just a month older than Zachary, Mark thought that might be a mitigating factor. You know, one of the things that we thought was an issue it, it, positive for us is, was George's age. But given everything else that was going on with who he was and what he had done, we just felt that it was going to be a death sentence. George Benvenuto's first court appearance was an arraignment on September 4th, 1996, exactly a week after the shooting. This was a brief appearance where he was assigned attorneys and bail was set at a million dollars. But it would have been the first opportunity for the Snar and Rodier families to see him in person. Zachary Snar's sister, Sydney, remembers the first time she saw her brother's killer. Our side of the courtroom was just standing room only. And I remember looking over and seeing his mom and his siblings sitting there. And that was it for him. And I remember just thinking, good. George walked into the courtroom and he was pale and he had his jumper on, the orange jumper, and he was handcuffed and they had a chain down to his ankles. So he was shackled. He had a goatee and it was all pointy and he was so pale and his hair was just black and his goatee was black and he wouldn't look at us. And I remember just thinking, he looks like, he looks like Satan to me. While Sydney saw the devil in George, Yvette Rodier's sister, Danielle, saw something very different. This kid walked through the door and I was like, oh, that's what a killer looks like? I mean, I was surprised that he didn't look like the boogeyman because he was he was evil in my mind. And to see that he looked just like a regular person, I didn't really know how to um, compartmentalize that. I didn't know where to put that. For Yvette, every court hearing was difficult because she had to be in the same room with the man who tried to kill her. They were so hard. At one hearing, I didn't know he was going to be there, so I hadn't mentally prepared. And they called the case, and he walked in, and I sobbed more than I've sobbed in public ever in my whole life, like embarrassingly sobbing, like the judge had to stop for a minute until I could get myself together. He has remained terrifying to me. I know I'm safe in the courtroom, mm -hmm. um, and he doesn't look at me or anything like that, but just, he terrifies me.
George made 15 court appearances between September 4th, 1996 and January 30th, 1998. And Mark remembers that every single one was emotionally charged. All I remember is walking into that courtroom and it was packed. And it was packed with family members of Zach Snar and Yvette Rodier. And you could cut the emotion with a knife. It was, it, it, these people hated George. And you can't blame them, but, but they hated him. And they were angry. The Snar's grief over losing Zach had hardened into hatred for the man who killed him. I was going to jump him in the courtroom and, and try to kill him myself with my bare hands. Zach's father, Ron, said he was consumed with thoughts of revenge. If I could be on the firing squad and I'd do it myself, they wouldn't need a firing squad. I'd just kill him with my bare hands. <laughs> Ron couldn't confront George, but he could make sure the rest of his family understood the pain George had inflicted on them. I, I blamed everybody with the name Bimvenuto. You know, they'd, they'd show up and and Mrs. Bimvenuto would be in there by her, well, her and her kids would be in there the first day. And and I thinking to myself, how could how could you raise such a monster that go and just go and start shooting people who didn't even know them, you know? How do you process that? And uh, so I, I always blamed them. They're the only ones in the room I could get at because I couldn't get at him. After one of those court appearances, Ron slid into the bench behind George's mother and told her exactly how he felt. You know, here she is just beside herself. I can understand the grief she was in and that now, but at the time I thought she was the cause of it. <laughs> you know, how could you raise such a monster? <laughs> what would you do wrong? And, you know, I was just letting her have it, telling her those things. His hatred extended to anyone associated with George, including the defense team. I thought, how could they sit there and try to defend this guy and get him off? And I, and I didn't have any respect for Martin Moffat or any of them sitting on. Anybody on that side of the room was uh, some of the lowest human beings on earth. Ron wasn't the only one thinking about how to hurt the man who'd taken Zach's life. I used to fantasize about what I would do for the opportunity to, you know, be in a room with him alone with a baseball bat. In the months since her brother was gunned down, Sydney's pain had turned to rage. I, I did. I spent so much time just wishing the worst on him. And I hope he's, you know, suffering. I hope he's, I hope he gets killed in prison. I wish they would have just shot him when they when they arrested him, why didn't they just kill him? You know, it, you hear of the stages of grief. This is in my, we'll call this my anger phase. <laughs> but I, I wanted him to suffer. On February 5th, 1997, a preliminary hearing was held in Salt Lake County's 3rd District Court. This was the hearing that would determine whether or not there was enough evidence for prosecutors to pursue the death penalty at trial. In this type of hearing, prosecutors tried to provide key evidence against the defendant, but it was never the entirety of the case. The goal was simply to convince a judge that there was enough evidence to bind a defendant over for trial. In this hearing, only a vet who'd survived the shooting and Keith Stevens, the lead detective, as well as a medical examiner, would testify. During the preliminary hearing, George sat in silence next to his lawyers, while a vet detailed what happened the night of the shooting. Even the formality of court with armed bailiffs nearby didn't make her feel safe. It was scary. I had to point him out, and my finger just shook as I was pointing him out. Yvette's Aunt Tony Sullivan watched her testify, feeling immense pride for her niece's courage. She sat with Yvette's mother, Linda, amazed at what the young woman was able to do under such difficult circumstances. I was in awe at her ability to communicate the important details. She was more composed than you would guess that she could be. And that it was because at that point, I think she'd reached the standpoint of the truth needs to be told. And I'm the only one who can tell it. 
and she became emotional a few times, but she never broke down. I mean, honestly, I felt, and I know that Linda did, because we talked about it, but it's like the pride of, of the mom saying, I don't know how my kid's doing this, but she is. I remember it being very powerful. Yvette's testimony just made George's defense attorney, Mark Moffat, even more apprehensive about the prospect of saving George's life. Her experience in that case, uh, it, it, it was, it, there's nothing we could do as a defense lawyers to undermine it. There's just, I mean, nothing. My memory is that we did that preliminary hearing. We saw these people testify. We saw Yvette testify. We knew what the evidence was against our client. We were as convinced as ever that George faced a very real possibility of a death sentence. But the legal system will make everyone question what justice means in this case. That's after the break. I'm really excited to tell you about The Jordan Harbinger Show, which is a podcast that we think the listeners of The Letter will also enjoy in their podcast queue. In every episode of this show, Jordan dives into the minds of fascinating people, from athletes, authors, and scientists, to FBI agents, political activists, and even hostage negotiators. Jordan Harbinger has an undeniable talent for getting his guests to share stories that they may never have shared publicly before. His conversations are full of never-been-heard-before stories and thought-provoking insights. And without fail, he pulls out tactical bits of wisdom from each guest, and you can't help but be a more informed, critical thinker. A recent episode had me examining my own life. It was with financial psychologist Dr. Brad Klontz on how our financial choices are often the result of beliefs and habits that were instilled in us as children. It was fascinating. But honestly, with new episodes every week coming out weekly, the top spot for my favorite episode is constantly evolving. You cannot go wrong with adding The Jordan Harbinger Show to your rotation. It's incredibly interesting, and there's never a dull show. Go to jordanharbinger.com slash start for more episode recommendations, or search for The Jordan Harbinger Show. That's H-A-R-B, as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. In my life, there's never enough time to read all the great books that have been written. My days are spent on the move, which is why Audible is one of my favorite apps. While I love reading, there is also something about listening to a story that feels different, maybe slightly more intimate. The best part of Audible is that I can listen while I hike, clean my house, or run errands. Audible has an incredible selection of audiobooks across every genre, from bestsellers and new releases to celebrity memoirs, mysteries, self-help, wellness, business, and more. As an Audible member, I get to choose one title a month to keep from their entire catalog. Right now, I'm listening to The Nickel Boys by Colson Whitehead. It's based on what happened at a real reform school in Florida for more than 111 years. It's gut-wrenching, maddening, and completely captivating. I also just finished Between Two Kingdoms, a memoir by Sulika Jawad, who spent her early 20s battling leukemia. This one is read by the author, and it's so beautifully written about where the best and worst parts of our lives overlap that I had to buy the hard copy so I could scribble some notes as I listened. Let Audible help you discover new ways to laugh, be inspired, or be entertained. New members can try it for free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash the letter or text the letter to 500-500. That's audible.com slash the letter or text the letter to 500-500 to try Audible for free for 30 days. Audible.com slash the letter. As the case progressed, the criminal justice process was taking a toll on everyone involved. It's really heavily emotional because... What it does is it brings back to victims exactly what happened. Prosecutor Roger Blaylock says court forces people to reckon with loss in a uniquely painful way. That sense of loss becomes apparent to everybody that's in the courtroom. You know, the family and everybody else. I would imagine even the defendant's family feel some sense of it because they can't fathom that their son or their brother would do something that bad. 
anyone who cared about the three families involved felt deep pain in these court appearances. I remember coming home every time, and I'd get, we'd get in the car to leave after those sessions and the things that led up to it, and I cried every single time. Yvette's Aunt Tony witnessed her struggles in the courtroom and in her life. I remember many times just praying that she'd be able to handle it, that it was like they are asking so much of her, and I can't imagine enduring what she's been through. I just can't even imagine it. She was waking up with nightmares on a regular basis. Her, her survival guilt got worse and worse. The more she started going through this, I want to tell this story because I want to make sure I want him to have to pay, I want the shooter to pay. But because of that, she's reliving these experiences. I mean, she has to tell the story over and over and over again. And that became very difficult for her. Yvette was determined to do what was asked. She was determined to get justice for Zach. But her mother was worried about her. She was definitely a mama bear, and she was really frustrated. During the court process, she felt like I was neglected in the process. And I didn't per se. I, But I was also 18, 19, and didn't really have any expectation. And so she just was very protective about me and wanted to be sure that everyone remembered me too. And I kind of didn't want to be remembered, but... She wanted to just be sure everything that they could do for me, they were doing. Meanwhile, Zach's mother realized she was not prepared to hear some of the details that would be shared in court proceedings. The day the medical examiner testified, I think, was the worst day of my life. Because she did show show a drawing of Zach and talked about where he shot him and... After he had shot him twice, he actually held the gun point blank to his head. And I had not known that. And that really affected me. It did. And I I had driven myself down there, and I literally had to pull over. I could not drive home because I was wailing, (laughs) sobbing. It really, it just killed me that that had happened to that beautiful boy of mine. You know, that his life ended that way. It was hard. The agony of reliving that night in court hearings began to make Sai have doubts about whether or not she could go through with the trial. At first, you know, I thought, no, we need to go to trial because he needs to die. But then Sai was watching news coverage of a murder at a video store on the west side of the Salt Lake Valley. And they were showing drawings of this person's body, showing where she'd been stabbed over and over. And I thought, I cannot watch this on TV about Zach. I can't do it. Death seemed the only semblance of justice to those left in the wake of the shooting. But the emotional price they'd have to pay to send George Benvenuto to his grave began to feel too high for some. That's when prosecutors proposed an alternative, one that would allow the families to move on without reliving every single excruciating detail of that horrific night. George could plead guilty, so there would be no trial. His life would be spared, but instead of a firing squad or a lethal dose of poison, the 19-year-old would never, ever leave the prison. Prosecutor Roger Blaylock says discussing plea deals with those devastated by violence is a delicate balancing act. Well, what you have to do is you have to be very honest with people who have lost loved ones like that. And we said, look, okay, if we go to trial, and if there's a guilty verdict, and if they impose the death penalty, that's another 20 years before there's any kind of real resolution on this. Because that's just kind of the way it is. There are going to be appeals and appeals and appeals and appeals. A plea promised to eliminate years of court battles. Do you feel like justice is served if he pleads guilty and we say, okay, we're not going to request the death penalty. It'll be life without parole. Is that something that you feel like meets what you want in the way of justice? Does that kind of balance things out? Nothing really could balance it out, but does that, does that give you a feeling that uh, what needed to be accomplished has been accomplished? 
we didn't know if that was even fair. Tony says their family really struggled with the idea of a plea deal. How can, how can he take a plea deal and that he's going to end up with in a position where he's going to be able to still live and stuff, but Zach doesn't get to live and Yvette doesn't get to live normally again? It was especially difficult for Yvette's mother, Linda, to accept. She said, I really want him to pay. And I, right now, I, I'm having a really hard time because I don't know that this is enough payment. It, it will never make anything right. She said, I want restitution, but restitution will never be paid. There's no way you can pay restitution for this. Yvette's family had to ask themselves what they really wanted. They considered the risks of going to trial. They listened to the prosecutor's reasoning. He said, the biggest reason that I encourage you to do this is because if one thing goes wrong in the courtroom and something isn't handled in the way that we want it to, and he could walk away. And things that are out of our control, that they could twist something or they're going to not allow some piece of evidence or something like that. And he said, we have a solid case. We know. We have a confession. And if, if anything goes wrong, you could lose this altogether. As for Yvette, she didn't think it was her decision to make. I don't recall thinking about it at that time. I definitely knew I was afraid of him, and so if there was something that would keep him away from me, I was all for it. But I I don't think I ever wished death upon him. Even though a plea deal didn't seem like the justice they were looking for, Tony says they focused on what Yvette wanted. That the man who killed her friend and intended to kill her never be allowed to hurt anybody again. Like Yvette's family, the Snars had mixed feelings about a plea deal. I was at first upset. Sydney felt like they owed Zach more of a fight. Like, what, what are we doing? Are we, are we not fighting hard enough? Like, why would we accept the plea? I want, him to, I want him to fry. But then she was watching a news report about a death penalty case in another state. And they were talking about the prisoner who was going to be executed. You know, there are people out there protesting his death and holding up signs saying, you know, he's, He's God's child, and he, you know, show mercy, and he's a born-again Christian, and he, you know, and and people were crying over his fate. And I remember just thinking, they have not mentioned the victim once, or the victim's families, or loved ones, or, you know, who's, who's representing the victim here? It's all about this really bad guy. Sydney began to think that if her brother's killer went to prison, people would just forget about him. He's going to fade into nothing, which is what he deserves, you know. And I remember just thinking that, like, well, at least 20 years from now, we won't be, you know, hearing about what a great guy he is. Well, three of us wanted to accept the plea bargain and two did not. Zach's mother, Cy, along with Sidney and his youngest brother, Levi, wanted to accept the plea deal. They wanted it to be over. They wanted George behind bars for the rest of his life. Ron and our oldest son mm-hmm. said, no, he, we need to go to trial. In an effort to help them make the decision, prosecutors arranged for them to visit the Utah State Prison. And we met the assistant warden, and he took us through that entire prison. And my, my husband and my son said, I'd rather be dead than be here. I understand this feeling. I covered corrections for six years, and I've spent time in most of Utah's prison facilities. Life in the maximum security units is bleak. It was during that time that I first met attorney Bob Steele, who was part of George Benvenuto's defense team. He spent his 40-year career working with death row and maximum security inmates. I remember the first time I did a tour, and I thought, I think I would rather die than live my whole life here. There, like, there, I can't think of anything less hopeful. No, and and it's, um, God, this is a horrible way to say it. It feels a little bit like going in the zoo in one of those places where they're hosing the poop off 
the floor and and then there's people yelling. It's the noisiest place you can imagine. It's all concrete and metal. And you put on top of that gang interactions. There's always the threat of a stabbing. There's always the threat of death. When you when you live in a punishment regime, there is an alternative governing body, and that's the inmates. And the inmates are in charge of a lot of the behavior that goes on, and the guards, I mean, they. Well, what can you do? You keep punishing? I mean, you, you can't modify the behavior in any meaningful way. Inmates in maximum security lived in rooms the size of walk-in closets. At the time, inmates were not allowed to work or exercise in the way other inmates could. I remember having a conversation with a death row inmate on a visit in 1996. He told me he didn't want to die, but he was considering dropping his appeals and accepting his fate. I asked him what would make him quit fighting for his life. Living in maximum security, he told me, was inhumane. It was devoid of ordinary pleasures, like enjoying fresh air, walking in the grass, or eating with other people. There were no normal human interactions, like handshakes or hugs. And it gave them nothing to look forward to, nothing to motivate them to be better people. There was, as he put it, no hope. Seeing the realities of life in prison helped Ron come around to the idea of a plea deal. There's something worse than death, and that's living in prison the rest of your life with your cell buddy. Sydney was out of state at the time, so she didn't see the prison for herself. But she talked to her family afterward. My older brother Trent said that it gave him nightmares. And I remember him telling me that I think I would rather die than live the rest of my life in that hellhole. And at that point, I was like, well, then good, do it. Let's forget about him. He can go in there and rot. Coming up after the break, the sentencing of George Benvenuto. Tired of the same old game nights? Bored with the same old board games or card games? Looking for a fun new activity to do with your family, your partner, your friends, or even by yourself? You should check out Hunt a Killer. With Hunt a Killer, you get to be the detective, sorting through evidence, piecing together clues, and solving the case in an immersive murder mystery game. Each Hunt a Killer box is a complete murder mystery that you have to solve. Pick from standalone one shot crimes, longer multi chapter mystery boxes, jigsaw puzzles, books, or an exclusive monthly subscription storyline that unfolds over six months. Just like real detective work, you must establish means, motive, and opportunity for each suspect. It's like your own episode of CSI combined with an escape room. I received the Dead on the Vine box, which was a twisting, turning, totally consuming whodunit. In this game, the family's matriarch is poisoned, and the killer had to be a member of her family. We love the ciphers, puzzles, and secrets we had to uncover in solving the crime. And because I've not so secretly wanted to be a private detective since I was a kid, I can't wait to start my next case. Take the case at huntakiller.com slash the letter and use code the letter for $10 off your purchase. That's huntakiller.com slash the letter and code the letter. Now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. A good therapist can help you become a better problem solver, making it easier to accomplish your goals, no matter how big or small. And BetterHelp Online Therapy can give you access to the right therapist for you. If I can share a little bit about my own mental health struggles. As a survivor of domestic abuse, therapy became my lifeline, a way out of what felt like endless darkness and pain. It has helped me more effectively manage problems throughout my life, some of them big and complicated like PTSD, while others are more mundane, like phases of life changes. I just recently started using BetterHelp, and I'm a huge fan, not just of what they do, but how they do it. Being able to talk with a licensed therapist who is matched with me and my specific needs in my own home, sometimes at times that a traditional therapist wouldn't be available, has been life-changing. I am so grateful for BetterHelp. 
BetterHelp can match you with a therapist after you fill out a brief survey, and you can switch therapists anytime. Honestly, this process was much easier and much faster than the traditional routes I've used in the past. If you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option. It's convenient, accessible, affordable, and entirely online. When you want to become a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit BetterHelp.com slash the letter today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp.com slash the letter. The families decided to accept the plea deal in return for the assurance that George Benvenuto would be locked away for the rest of his life. Mark remembers taking the offer to his client. Oh, it's horrible. He felt the plea deal was the only way to save George's life. So I've got a, a basically a 19 or maybe he was 20 then, barely 20, when uh, we were sort of made that offer. So I had a very young person asking me questions like, what's the difference for me between death and spending every day for the rest of my life in prison? How is that good for me? And those were incredibly difficult questions to answer. And... George, at that time, was vacillating. He still had suicidal ideation going on. So he was hoping that the state would put him to death. And you're, as a defense lawyer, sort of hardwired to avoiding the death penalty in a case like this, where you're almost certain he would get it if you put it in front of a jury. Anything else is a victory. So you kind of measure it differently than you might in any other case. Absolutely. So when we sat down and talked with George, imposition of the death penalty was such a viable... uh, It was a real threat. A real real threat. Yeah. And Um, so you're saying this is a real option, but he's suicidal. So that might not be a deterrent. That might not be persuading him. No. And when you do death penalty work, there are people that you come to know as we call them volunteers um, who basically say, I'm not going to fight. I'm not, you know, and, and George was on certain days a volunteer other days not. I mean, he vacillated, and it made these discussions really hard. And they continued right up until the moments before the plea. On October 5th, 1997, George was scheduled to enter a guilty plea. He shared his uncertainty with his attorneys, even as they prepared to stand before the judge. Even up until the moments before he was to go in and enter his plea, he still had reservations about it. Shortly after George entered his guilty plea, the Benvenutos fired the public defense team and hired a private attorney, Robert Booker. Mark was given no explanation, but the move signaled a change in legal strategy. The defense team that had fought so hard to save George's life ended up watching the sentencing from the gallery. The hearing was essentially a formality. Because of the plea agreement, the outcome was not a mystery. Everyone knew going into it that George Benvenuto would be sentenced to life in prison without parole. Still, this hearing in January of 1998, 17 months after the shooting, was the first time the victims would speak in court about how it had changed their lives. Before they spoke, the judge asked Mr. Booker if George Benvenuto would like to speak. Mr. Booker said his client had chosen not to make a statement, but that he would make a few comments on his behalf. This is a very, very difficult case, Booker said. Quote, it's a case that certainly offers far more questions than answers to anyone. I do feel confident that Mr. Benvenuto is very, very, very much regrets whatever it is that went wrong on that night, end quote. One after another, those left in the ruins of the shooting tried to put their pain into words. Your Honor, Zach's father, Ron, said, we struggled with the idea of making a plea bargain. We felt we were the only ones doing everything possible to make sure there was justice for Zachary. We didn't want to let him down. The irony is that Zachary would have been the first one to forgive. Zach's mother, Sai, told the judge, I need to know that the murderer will never walk free. He made a terrible choice. Now he must pay the consequences for that choice. We need some closure. 
our family needs to get on with our lives. Yvette needs to get on with her life. But we cannot do that until we know that we and everyone else are safe. Yvette's mother, Linda, also shared her feelings with the court. She said, quote, I think it is important for the court to know, and that everyone here know, that on August 28, 1996, Mr. Benvenuto killed two people. We miss a part of Yvette that will never be here. There is a part of her that is dead, and I don't know that it will ever be returned to us. Yvette also stood in the courtroom to speak that day. Until this moment, her words were meant to detail the facts of a crime. Everything she'd offered was in response to the questions from detectives or prosecutors. But this statement, written by a 19-year-old Yvette and then read in court, is the most complete account of how this traumatic experience changed her life. It is the only record of how she felt in those months after surviving a shooting that robbed her friend of his life. For that reason, the court transcript is read here by an actor. On August 28th, 1996, the word that describes that night the most is alone. I was with my dearest, closest friend, and he was murdered right next to me. It's hard to describe the feelings that go through your mind when you know that someone that you love dearly is laying dead beside you. I was shot many times. I don't know how many. I've got the scars to prove it. But I was alone that night. After a person who just murdered my friend rummaged through my clothing and I can feel his hands on my body, I was alone. I guess you really don't know what happens until after, but I remember it all. There is nothing that I have forgotten and I don't know if I ever will forget. Since that night, my body has basically been ripped apart again. I've had five operations, one more to come, most of them on my head, opening my head, taking pieces out, putting them back in. Right now I have a hole in my head. How do I explain that to someone? I try to cover it up, but I know it's there. I know I've got a hole in my head because someone shot me. The pain that I've incurred because of these operations is amazing. They give me shots as soon as they can, only to push the pain away for 10 or 15 minutes. Then I have to wait another three or four hours to get another one. It's horrible. It's happened five times now, and I know I have to go at least once again. Each time I have an operation, my head swells to the size of a watermelon. It's painful, and I lose most of my hair, which for a 19-year-old, that's hard. I know it seems vain, but I guess it's the little things that hurt us almost the most. Those are just physical things. Who cares, really? I can handle those. It's the psychological pain that I think has hurt the most. And I know what depression is. I know because I have suffered it many days. I think a lot of it has come from survivor's guilt. I know that's a clinical term, but I feel guilty that Zach died. And I don't know if the person who has done this does. I sure hope so. But I didn't try CPR. I know CPR. Why didn't I do it? I didn't try to hold his wound or hold him tight. I can remember his family's phone number in the operating room. And I called that number almost every day and I couldn't remember it. I hate dealing with that guilt. It's so unfair. I hate that feeling. And a lot of my psychological pain is fear. I'm afraid to cross the street. I'm afraid someone is attacking me. I'm afraid someone is stalking me. I'm afraid of nighttime. I'm afraid of gunshots on the television. My whole family has had to alter their life so I wouldn't have to be alone by myself. I'm too afraid of my fears. I don't sleep. I have horrible nightmares that I die or that people I love die. 
I think part of a lot of the psychological stuff is that I know that when he stopped that shooting and reloaded, that he was aiming right at me and that it was me he wanted to kill. And that's a horrible pain that I hope nobody would ever have to have again. Zach and I are not the only victims here. Our families and friends, our communities are too. It's not just us we need to have justice for. It's for all of us around us. I just, I know that I have a family who loves me and protects me and takes care of me. And I'm thankful for that because I don't think I would be strong enough to stand today and say how much this has hurt me. But out of all of this, I can deal with it. I'm alive. I can wake up tomorrow. I'm lucky. But Zach never will. And I have lost a dear dear friend, and that is what's so unfair to me. I lost someone who remembered my birthday and who loved me and looked out for me. That's what is the most unfair in this case. I appreciate the sentence that's being made today to serve justice for our families and friends. Thank you for your time. Judge Ann Sturba, who died in 2001, explained that she had read the letters provided by the families. She had reviewed the case and given it a great deal of thought. Then she addressed George Benvenuto directly. She said, I cannot imagine the pain of losing a child. You will never know what it is like to have a child or to lose a child. Mr. Benvenuto, I don't think you will ever know the pain, the full extent the full measure of pain which you have caused. Judge Sturba said she was struck by all the letters she received from people who said Zachary Snar was their best friend. The judge expressed awe for a vet. Quote, What a vet is today, she is because of her own incredible courage and her strength and her will to heal despite what you took from her. She sentenced George Benvenuto to spend the rest of his natural life in the Utah State Prison. Parole would never be a possibility. Judge Sturba took the extraordinary step of saying that she would write a letter to the Board of Pardons and Parole recommending that he never leave prison. I felt so safe when he got life in prison without parole. For a vet, Judge Sturba's words were exactly what she needed to hear. It, to me, just made the world a safe place for me again. And I wasn't afraid necessarily he was getting out, but to have the judge say that, it definitely felt so good. Yvette says she will always remember the way Judge Sturba made her feel. Because you feel like the defendant is the only one who is being protected, is being heard throughout the process. And while that may not be true, your voice, it it feels like your voice is not part of this process. And so just to be able to talk and have a judge listen is so validating. TV cameras captured the moment the snars emerged from the courtroom that day. I hope, like the judge says, he'll never walk out of the state prison. He can go out there and sit in a hole and rot the rest of his life, as far as I'm concerned. After court, there were more hugs and tears and relief. I never have to see him again. I think that's what makes me the happiest because it's the hardest thing I've ever had to do is sit in that same courtroom with him and just sit there. It's hard. So I was relieved because she thought it would be the last time she'd ever have to face George Benvenuto. I thought I'd, I won't have to even think about him or, you know, I'll never have to see him. I'll never have to hear his name again. Did you feel like, okay, it's over? Oh, I did. I was so naive. <laughs> Next time on The Letter... The Snars realize what rage has done to their lives. 
When you have that much hatred and anger in you, you become that. You are angry and hateful. I didn't like it. I didn't like what I had become. It's a tough one. Death or life behind bars. This is producer Andrea Smartin. And on this week's bonus episode, Amy has questions for defense attorney Mark Moffat about the death penalty, life without parole, and decisions made in the 90s that are still affecting all of us today. You can get all the bonus content by subscribing to Lemonada Premium. You can subscribe right now in the Apple Podcast app by clicking on our podcast logo and then click the subscribe button. The letter is researched and reported by me, Amy Donaldson. It's written by myself and Andreas Martin, who is also responsible for production and sound design. Mixing by Trent Sell. Special thanks to Nina Ernest, Becky Bruce, Kellyanne Halverson, Ryan Meeks, Josh Tilton, Ben Kiebrick, and Dave Colley. Main musical score composed by Allison Layton Brown. With KSL Podcast executive producer Cheryl Worsley. For Lemonada Media, executive producers Jessica Cordova Kramer and Stephanie Whittleswax. And executive producers Paul Anderson and Nick Pinella with Workhouse Media. If you like our show, please give us a rating and a review. It helps people find us. Follow us at theletterpodcast.com and on social at The Letter Podcast. The Letter is produced by KSL Podcasts and Lemonada Media in association with Workhouse Media. Hey, The Letter listeners, we want to hear from you. You know we love our sponsors for a ton of reasons, but one of the main ones is because they help us keep the lights on. And there's a really easy way that you can help us draw new advertisers and hear ads for things that you're most interested in. Filling out our quick anonymous survey at lemonadamedia.com slash survey. By answering just a few questions, you can help us find new brands to connect with and also share feedback about show content you'd like to see across the network. And to sweeten the deal, once you've completed the survey, you can enter for a chance to win a $100 Visa gift card. I promise the survey is short and sweet and will help us play ads you don't want to skip. And also, keep bringing you content you love. Just go to lemonadamedia.com slash survey. The Webby Award-winning series The Untold Story is back for Season 3. In Season 1, The Untold Story took a deep dive into the pitfalls of modern policing. The second season explored the failings of the American court system— In this new season, host Trayvon Free shines a light on human rights violations that are taking place right before our eyes in America. Each episode contains tangible, real strategies to begin enacting positive change in our communities. All three episodes of Untold Story, Criminal Injustice from Lemonada Media premiere on October 25th, wherever you get your podcasts.